The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say. Thank you again for joining us on The Final Word. We've been in a discussion on the religious theory called Calvinism. It's a theory on the idea of God. We have in the previous shows proven that God created man, that He gave man free will to choose, and many times, unfortunately, men made wrong choices. Now, we finished last time talking about something called total hereditary depravity. We showed that God does not, according to the Holy Bible, God does not place the guilt of sin on any individual uh, except the person who did that sin. Of course, we discussed Ezekiel chapter 18 last time. Today we will discuss the second tenet, or petal, if you will, on the Calvinistic flower, the tulip. We will discuss the U, which is unconditional election. Let us start by using their own words to define what they mean, and then let us define exactly what is meant by unconditional and what is meant by election. The Westminster Confession of Faith says, By the decree of God, for the manifestation of His glory, uh, some men and angels are predestined unto uh, everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. These angels and men thus predestinated and foreordain, or ordained are particularly and unchangeably designed. Their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. Uh, those of mankind that are predestinated unto life, God before the foundation of the world, was laid uh, according to His eternal, immutable purpose and the secret counsel of His good pleasure and of His will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of His mere free grace and love, without any foresight of faith or of good works or of perseverance in either of them, or any other thing in the creature, as conditions or causes moving Him thereunto. So what is meant by election? Well, it simply means to choose. God chose according to this doctrine. He chose certain ones to be saved and certain ones to be damned. What then is meant by unconditional? Obviously it means that having no condition whatsoever. That is what they mean when they say without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance in either of them or any other thing in the creature as conditions or causes moving him thereunto. So today we will hold their belief up to God's Word and see whether it is the case or not. Now someone says, well, Philip, do you believe in election? The Bible talks about election. Yes, indeed it does. The, the question is not whether people were elected. Really, the question is twofold. First, what were people elected to? And then second, in what way is election done today? So let us deal with that first question first. What were people elected to? It is true that in God's will, people have always been elected. The question is, elected to what? Uh, were they elected to eternal salvation? Or were they elected to some other thing? If people are, as the Calvinist presumes, elected to salvation, you know, Paul wrote some very confusing words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, when he said, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out? Uh, how? When God has already worked it out for you. you know, I believe after this show is finished, you will have a proper understanding of election as the Bible spells it out and not as the Calvinists would have you to believe based on their faulty theory. So election. Uh, who is chosen and for what purpose? You know, not all people were chosen for the same purpose. Uh, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 42, beginning in verse 1, we read, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Uh, obviously, this is a reference to Jesus. Jesus claimed as much over in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, so what was he elected to? Was he electing his own salvation? Well, obviously not. He was elected then for some other purpose. Uh, the election of Christ was that he was to come and to seek and to save the lost. 
In fact, many people were elected to make the way for Jesus. His ancestry is recorded in Matthew chapter 1, also in Luke chapter 3. Uh, all of them uh, were elected to bring salvation into the world. Abraham was told in Genesis chapter 12 that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But he also had two sons, so an election had to take place. A choice had to be made. So who would be chosen? Well, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Later, Jacob would have twelve sons. Again, a choice had to be made. Who would bring the Christ into the world? Uh, not to bless just one family, but, but to bring Christ into the world to, to bless the whole world. And so Judah would be chosen. And then you will recall they went into Egyptian captivity and Moses was chosen to lead them out. And notice Psalm chapter 106 and verse 23. Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he should destroy them. And so Moses clearly was chosen and, and so was Aaron. Notice Psalm 105 verse 26. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. You see, they were indeed chosen, but the question before us today is, what were they chosen to do? They were specially chosen to bring the children of Israel out of bondage and to lead them to the promised land. Now, if they were specifically chosen by God to do this, then according to the Calvinists, that is what must happen. Two people specifically chosen by God, their purpose, lead the people into the promised land. Now remember, according to Calvinists, no purpose of God can be changed. Well, let's turn over into our Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, and swear that I should not go over to Jordan, and that I should not go in into the good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. Well, but well, wait a minute. What just happened? The, uh, the ones that God specially chose to lead the people into the land of Canaan, the, the promised land, uh, only now uh, they don't even get to enter into it. But the question is, why not? Isn't that what God had purposed for them to do? Uh, look at the book of Numbers chapter 20 and verse 8. The people are thirsty again. They're complaining again. And in verse 8, God instructs Moses and Aaron to stand before the people. And he, com he, he commanded them to speak to the rock. But Moses and Aaron disobeyed God. Moses uh, lifted his rod in his hand and he struck the rock with his rod. Uh, it was complete disobedience. Notice God said, speak, but he struck. And because of that, notice what God says in verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. You see, they were specially chosen to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, and yet they would not go into it. And down in verse 24, you also see that even Aaron would disobey God and would not enter the promised land either. The point is this. God specially chose them, but because of their choice, because of their disobedience, God would punish them. Well, what about Aaron's sons? Would they do any better? Uh, Leviticus chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, we read, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, let's notice what was said by the Calvinist again. God, from all eternity, did by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will freely and unchangeably ordain, what, uh, uh, ordain whatsoever comes to pass. So what do we see in these scenarios? You see, if their doctrine is true, we must wonder to which class did Nadab and Abihu belong? The eternally elect or the eternally damned? 
Did he elect, as the Calvinist believes, dead, worldly sinners who cannot possibly follow God? Did God elect them and anoint them priests to go to God on behalf of the people when all along He foreordained that He would cause them to sin so that He could then destroy them? Well, if you don't like that scenario, maybe you'll like this one better. Maybe God elected them to be saved unconditionally. They were, uh, they were going to heaven no matter what. And so then He caused them to, to sin, to, to die in their sins and to take them home to glory still in their sin. Well, does that make sense? Of course it doesn't. Folks, the, the biblical truth of the matter is neither of those are the case because unconditional election is not true. Yes, they were elected to do a work. They were consecrated as, as priests of God. God had told all of Israel if they would obey Him, He would bless them. If not, He would curse them. And that was His intent with Nadab and Abihu as well. Only they did not obey. They sinned and they died in their sins. Well, now someone might say, well, you know, he took their life, but he saved their souls. In other words, uh, sins do not affect your soul, but, but only your body. Well, that's ridiculous in the light of all Scripture. Uh, I'll simply just cite one passage, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 27. It says, what, uh, what I tell you in darkness, that speak you in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach you upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Obviously, the point is, you know, when you go out there and you start preaching, harm is going to come up upon your body. You might even be killed. He says, don't be afraid of what might happen to your body, but fear those who could destroy your soul. Well, how's that? by leading you away from Christ. How could a soul be in any danger if God had already unconditionally elected it before the world had ever begun? It couldn't. There's no need for a warning if Calvinism is true. And yet Christ warned those that He would send out because He knew that He had not unconditionally elected anyone to salvation. Folks, we see it over and over again. The Word of God says one thing, Calvinism teaches something contrary to what God says. Uh, we have proven it time and time again. Unconditional election, like every other point in Calvinism, takes any responsibility away from man. And so uh, whoever lives in eternity in heaven has God to thank, but also whoever lives uh, eternal life in hell also has God to thank. The Calvinist doesn't like it, but folks, it's that simple. It's the simple conclusion of their doctrine. Uh, the theory of unconditional election denies that man is a free moral agent and that he may choose to either accept or reject God's conditions of salvation. But what does God say? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Christ tells us that man is not arbitrarily chosen by God for either heaven or hell, but that entering the kingdom of heaven is sub subject to one's obeying the will of the Father. Uh, the fact cannot be disputed that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3.16. In fact, this one passage of Scripture does away with the whole idea of Calvinism. Uh, notice the next verse, verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, if a person believes, then a person has a choice. The choice is believe and have life, or don't believe and don't have life. But know this, that person has a choice. Accept and follow God or, or reject God and be condemned. That is the choice. God did not elect certain ones, uh, not at all. The Savior would stand before the people and say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy 
My burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. It is, folks, and always has been God's will that all should be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, we read that God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Peter said, The, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Hebrews writer wrote that, Though he was a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became unto all them that obey him the author of eternal salvation. And so the astute Bible student will quickly observe that God has provided salvation for all men if they will comply with the conditions that he has set forth. God's word reminds man of his responsibility to respond in obedience to the great invitation. Uh, Peter proclaimed the, the gospel to the Jews, and he exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation, Acts 2, verse 40. Paul admonished the brethren at Philippi by saying, So then, my beloved, even as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God could not be more clear in stating that those who will be eternally damned are lost only because of their choice not to obey the gospel and not to live for the Lord. As we continue our study on election, you know, if, if one believes the Bible, he must believe in conditional predestination or conditional election because that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, Paul says to the Ephesians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before Him in love. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. It is clear that God did indeed choose before the foundations of the world some to be saved and some to be lost. God elected those in Christ to be saved. The implica implication is clear that those who are not in Christ are going to be lost. So in Christ is salvation and out of Christ is damnation. Paul said to the Christians in Rome and he said, and we know that to them that love God all things work together for good, even to them that are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also foreordained to be uh, confined to the uh, image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he foreordained, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Uh, but notice, all things work together for good. For whom? Obviously, all things work together for good to those who have chosen to love God. Calvinism teaches that things work together for good only for the lucky few people that God has unconditionally chosen to love. Uh, the, the saved are called according to His purpose. And folks, there is no mystery whatsoever regarding God's calling of mankind. All people who are called by God are called by the gospel. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, "...whereunto He called you by our gospel." to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, we are indeed called. We are called by the gospel. God provided uh, through the gift of His Son uh, the, the saving gospel which is to be proclaimed to all people because all people have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Christ said to His, his apostles, Go ye into all the world, Preach the gospel to the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. God is responsible for providing salvation and determining the conditions that accompany it. Man is responsible for believing in God and demonstrating his faith by obedience to God's word. Someone might ask, well, how can salvation be a gift and yet be conditional? Uh, they claim, well, well, they can't understand how a gift could be conditional. Oh, I suggest to you that they can understand it. 
for even birthday gifts are conditional. You know, the person must turn another year older in order to receive his gift. Do they understand a person's last will and testament? Uh, his will, uh, uh, that is, uh, a person will go in and write his will and leave gifts bestowed upon people uh, in his, his family, his friends. A person might in his own will say, you know, upon my grandson's graduation from college, he is to inherit my $100,000 inheritance. Well, was that a gift? Oh, absolutely it was. Was it conditional? Well, you know that it was. The grandson had to put in the time to go to college, actually make good enough grades to graduate. You see, obeying the commands of the gospel cannot be considered as earning salvation. The difference between a work of man and a work of God is that if it is a work of merit, the act alone will accomplish the end. But if God must act in addition to that deed uh, done, then, then it is God's work and not man's. Remember, Noah had to work in order to be saved. He didn't earn his salvation. He simply obeyed what God told him to do. Naaman the leper, as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 5, had to wash, uh, just as the man said, uh, wash seven times. And so seven times he had to dip in order to be cleansed. Now, was the cleansing a gift? Absolutely it was. Did he earn his cleansing? Absolutely not. Did he have to do anything to receive his cleansing? Oh, absolutely. Folks, I don't want to get too far off topic. Uh, the Bible is clear that there is a such thing as predestination, that God has chosen people to be saved and people to be lost. The question is, did He choose specifically or did He choose generally? You know, a person can choose one specific person or he can choose people in general. Suppose that there is a group of people and we are all here in the room and we all want to go to the movies tonight, but I'm the only one who can drive. Now, I can select individuals. I can say, okay, I want you to go, and, and I want you to go, and, and I want to choose you. And I could specifically choose individuals to go with me. Or I could say, I know that all of you want to go to the movies tonight. So tonight, whoever shows up here at 7 p.m. with $10 for the movie, then we will go. Now, if you do not show up at 7, you're not going to be able to go. If you do show up at 7, but you don't bring $10, still again, you do not get to go. But if you will do what I have said, then I will bring you to the movies with me. Now, I want to simply read one verse with you, and, and you can tell me which election God is working with. Was it specific, meaning choosing of each individual, or was it general, in which he said to do certain things, and those who did that would be saved? Turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, there is a selection. Lord, who gets to enter the kingdom of heaven? Is it everyone who wants to? Is it some specific people that you chose to? Or is it those who will do the will of God? Well... It is those who will do the will of God. Specific people chosen? No. Anyone who does what God says can enter the kingdom of heaven. And folks, you can too by simply following the truth in the Bible. Uh, so what have we seen today? First, God has uh, indeed called people to do certain specific works. But nowhere in the word of God do you find God unconditionally electing anyone specifically to salvation. However, what you do see is that from the foundations of the world, God has indeed elected all to be saved in Christ Jesus. So the important question is, how does one get in to Christ and become one of God's elect? The Bible provides the answer. First, the scriptures teach that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. A person must take heed as to what he hears. Uh, one who will not hear God's word cannot be saved. Second, all people must believe the word of God. Without faith in God or, or his word, it is impossible to please him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my sayings hath one that judgeth him. The word that I spake, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12 48. 
Third, all must be willing to repent of their sins. We do have a choice, and the choice is ours. We can choose to repent, to, to turn from, to give up our sins, or we can perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. One who refuses to comply with God's conditions of repentance and continues to live in his sins cannot be saved. Fourth, one must confess Christ as Lord. It was Paul who taught that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10 verse 10. Fifth, every person of the age of accountability must be immersed for the remission of his sins. This final condition in the gospel plan of salvation is, is not more important than any of the other conditions, but it's also not any less important. However, it must be accepted and it must be accepted on God's terms. To the Galatians, Paul said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ did put on Christ. Galatians 3, 27. No person has put on Christ until he has been baptized into Christ. One cannot be a, a new creature without being in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Bible baptism is a burial. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. It is not a sprinkling. We must remember it is God's conditions that we must comply with if we are to be saved. When a person genuinely complies with the conditions that God has set forth for salvation, the Lord will add that person to His church. Uh, those who choose to obey not the gospel, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, will be lost. Folks, this is how God predestinated it to be. Even before the foundations of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. May God help us folks to study His Word, for in His Word are the words of eternal life. Friend, God has not unconditionally elected any person for salvation. Uh, rather, He has chosen all who are called by the gospel, who believe, repent, confess, and are baptized. They have done what Christ has said. Sitting at the feet of Jesus Oh, what words I hear Him say Happy place so near, so precious May it find me there each day At the feet of Jesus, I would look upon the... If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at tftw.org. The preceding program was a production of Truth for the World, a work of the Duluth Church of Christ.